I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm coming to you from the greater Los Angeles area. We're at Mix This, the home studio of Bob Clearmountain. Yeah, it's, I'm glad to have you here, Mitch. Yeah, thank you for, for inviting us in. This is, man, home studio, right? <laughs> it's my little project studio. Yeah, right. <laughs> with a 72 input. SSL. <laughs> this is pretty awesome. I mean, the, the signals that have passed through this console, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, a lot. It's been quite, quite a bit over the last uh, 27 years, I think, yeah. since 93. Well, this is 94. Okay, and was this a space here? Was it empty, or how did you convert it into a studio? So when the real estate agent first showed us this place, I mean, we were looking for a place with a, a guest house or a large garage or something like that. But she showed us, she was really smart. She, she said, you should look at this because it's got a rather large basement. I thought, well, that, that's pretty cool. This is big enough for a, you know, I thought about it. This is definitely big enough for a control room. Mm -hmm. And then next door, there's another room, which is like a utility room. And I thought, well, a machine room, how about that? Right. Perfect size for a machine room. There was another door behind that that was a wine cellar. Mm -hmm. A wine cellar. And I looked at it, it was just this long, empty room with no ventilation and no windows. Echo chamber, right. <laughs> immediately, that's, that's my, my first thought. Before I even went upstairs, I said, Betty, nah, we gotta get this place. <laughs> this is the secret door to the machine room. Come this way. You spin around. Here's the, the state-of-the-art computer on these, these state-of-the-art floppy disks. <laughs> and uh, so this is the SSL. This is a new, a fairly new power supply, switching power supply, which replaced a big rack of power supplies that came with the system. So th this is a computer. Um, this is the power supply for the motorized faders. This is the power supply for, for the computer. And then this is my uh, audio server. Well, there's two servers. This is 16 terabyte, this is a 24 terabyte. This is the, my old cheese grater that runs the, um, the multi-track rig. And this is a Symphony Mark II, which is on the print rig and also the monitor, the 12 channel monitor controller, which is connected to that remote in the other room. Got the old Big Ben, Apogee Big Ben, kind of keeping everything in sync. And then this is the computer for the print rig. This, this room used to have a, a 3348 Sony digital recorder, a 3324 24 track digital recorder, and an 800. A couple of those are over at the Apogee studio now, which aren't really used for much for anymore. And then this back here, when we bought the house, this was a wine cellar. And we turned it into two echo chambers. Right now it's storage because I needed the storage more than I needed reverb because because we made we did impulse responses, which are available in Clear Mountain Spaces and Clear Mountain's domain. And so normally when it was cleared out and there was nothing in here, there was a, a microphone in each of these rooms and a Mackie speaker and um, it was reverb. I mean, obviously it's really dead now, but with nothing in it, it's a nice, it's a nice sound. I mean, you can he hear it on uh, Claremont's Domain. And these are all <laughs> recall notes from all the way back when, you know, when we started in around the 1800s. Here's a studio lounge. I've actually recorded two albums in here before we built the Apogee Studio. I produced a couple albums for a, a great artist named Jonathan Brooke. Um, in fact, she did, did some records at Sweetwater, I believe. And then here's our little resort. Got a pool, got a 35-foot pool slide, outdoor kitchen. What ha was happening before the pandemic, we'd have artists come over and the record company people, the A&R guys and the managers, they'd always show up right around dinner time. Oh, oh, it's dinner? Oh yeah, dinner, oh great. <laughs> One of the interesting things that I, I notice as I look around the room and as I've, as I've walked around, you, you've got the, the treated walls, the soft walls, but there's a lot of diffusion in here, actually. That's right. Tell me about your choice of having diffusion around the mix position. My architect, a guy named Brett Taney, from a, his company's called Bodo Design, and they've done a few, they did a room for prints, and they've done a lot of post-production rooms. He's a really good acoustician. Of course, this is a square room mm -hmm. with a very low ceiling, it's only eight feet, and parallel concrete walls. I mean, geez, that couldn't be 
worse, right. you know, for standing waves. And so he, he designed all, all the, the diffusion, his big diffusers over the top that his company built. And these, uh, he had these other things made. And there's a window over there, and he put, he put these slatted diffusers in front of the window and duplicated it on the other side where my secret door into the machine room is. Ah, yeah. And it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. it, it really does. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been great. It was pretty good right off the bat. The first thing we ever mixed here was a song called Streets of Philadelphia by Bruce Springsteen. Right. Wow. You know, before it was even done. In fact, we didn't get the inf final inspection. We couldn't put the diffusers on that wall. But you did the mix anyway. Yeah, we mixed it anyway. I think I threw up some blankets or something on the wall, you right. know, but it was fine. Man, that, but that's just a testament that you can make it work. You can make it work. Yeah, and do obviously very high level work with it. Yeah, when we first opened, I didn't have all this gear, so and I didn't wasn't really sure if a studio in the basement was going to work out. So we rented gear from Sting. He had something called he called he called it steer pike, I think. It was a fold-up SSL, I think he still has it, that split into three sections. It was 64 amp, but it's a little smaller than this one. And then it was on hinges, and so the whole thing would hinge up that way, and it would sit in its in a road case. You just hang, put this road case over the top of it. Uh -huh. had these big, huge connectors in the back. You wheel the thing in, set up the whole system in half an hour and wow. be up and running. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It had racks of gear. He had a 3348 tape machine, chairs, speakers, everything. <laughs> it was great. So I had that for six months uh -huh. until we realized I was booked every day right. for the first six months, and it was working great. So then I sent his, the system back to him, and then I bought SSL made, built me this G, G Series, G Plus. Right. And then I bought a bunch of other gear. And, right. Uh, off we went. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the workflow. Are you relying a lot on outboard gear? Are you mainly doing Clear Mountain's Domain and, and some of the plugins you developed with Apogee, or how are you processing signals? Well, more and more, it's plugins. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd say that, because I'm a real old-fashioned old analog guy, obviously. Especially with the Apogee plugins, I, find, I never really liked plugins much, but since Apogee's been making them, I've I really started to like them, of course, there's a few that have my name on them. Right. So I'm using those for delays and effects and things like that. I've been using Altiverb as reverbs because they do a lot of quad impulse responses for amazing places. They've done so many around mm -hmm. the world. And so I actually use, use reverbs in the box as outboard gear. So I'm sending from auxes on the console into the the whatever session I'm working on in the multi-track and uh, using the the uh, reverb plugins in there and the delay and the clear mountains domain plugins and it, all that right and that works great because it just saves with the session which is so much less to recall right although we have a whole system based on uh, FileMaker Pro to write down all the gear so but I'm using less and less of that now right and so the recalls come back in 45 minutes that's great. It's pretty simple. Yeah, yeah. So your your Pro Tools is your DAW of choice. Pro Tools is the is the one I, I mainly use. That's mostly what we get. Right, and I'm gonna hazard a guess. Uh, Apogee converters. Oh, it's all Apogee converters. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I have three um, Mark ones for the multi track. Mm -hmm. They've been fine, and so I haven't. Um, you know, I have to pay for my converters, yeah. even though <laughs> my wife owns the company. But uh, so I I kept those. I have two Mark ones. One of them is on the print rig, because I have two print rigs. I have a multi-track rig and a print rig. So I go mix through the console to the print rig. And uh, so I have a Mark II on the print rig, which is also the monitor controller, which works off of this remote here, this Apogee remote. Mm -hmm. And then I have another Mark II over here, which I actually paid retail for at Sweetwater. Yeah? I ordered it from my my buddy, uh, Kenny Burgle. Yeah? And, um, he was a little shocked, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, he saw the order. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a and, surprise. Uh, yeah. But that one mainly I got because the way I do Atmos and, well, 5.1 and for the last 22 years, I do the 5.1 and the Atmos at the same time as the stereo. So the stereo is coming off the pan pots, mm -hmm. and, and then there's the small fader, which is at unity gain, which is on the output of the fader that sends to the, the multi-track buses. And that's where my assignments for my uh, Atmos channels happen. Ah, okay. Now, normally, you, if you were 
just doing stereo, you'd have plenty of these small faders to use as, re as effects returns, mm -hmm. right? Well, I use them all for in the send channel, and so I don't have that advantage. So I use that Mark II over here just as a line mixer for my effects oh, returns. Okay. Right. Right, and then they come up on a bunch of stereo faders down the end there. Right. I was, oh. There's, there's Walter. There's Walter, the, the uh, studio cat. The studio cat, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Walter. So the, so what I did when, when I went to 5.1, I thought, well, how can I keep that sound? Because I really like the sound of that compressor. And luckily, this console comes with eight extra VCAs, which are the same VCAs that are in the stereo compressor. And so what we did with some help from some people over at Apogee, Lucas Vandermee, we came up with a little circuit that using the, the control voltage out of the stereo compressor to drive the, these VCAs. Mm -hmm. And they're just patchable VCAs, so I'm patching all those buses through the patchable VCAs to the Pro Tools rig. And that, that has been working really well. There's a little op amp in there, I think, to, to bring the voltage up. Uh -huh. um, but then when I went to Atmos, I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? And so my assistant, Brandon, who's amazing, found on, on some used audio site uh, another, what they call the Euro rack, which is where these VCA cards live in the console. Okay. He found a whole rack of that, of <laughs> four more stereo cards, right? So now we've tied that in with all this. So now I have a 16-channel analog compressor for oh, Atmos. Wow. Yeah, that's got to be unique in the world, <laughs> pretty I much. Think I think it might be. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Plus, we've added little, these controls, so I can compress a bit less for the side speakers or the rear speakers or the overhead speakers, uh -huh. which really comes in handy for live albums and live uh, concert videos, because sometimes I'll hit the, the compressor a little pretty hard, and then it just sounds like the audience is fluttering in uh, and out, because okay. it's all compressing the same. Sure. So I can actually compress less for the other channels. Oh, right, right. When you were out at Sweetwater recently, we were talking about how you had uh, put together the Atmos rig that you have here, because you are in a basement, you've got a living room above you, and so ceiling speakers are, are a thing. That's right, and so I just found these little Sony, they're, they're really just consumer speakers designed for Atmos, but they're designed to put on your front stereo speakers to bounce the height channels off the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Of course, that wouldn't work here because of the diffusers, but they work great when I just bolted them right into the ceiling. They're, they work fine. I mean, they're not the best speakers in the world, but they're, they're not bad. They're actually pretty good. Uh -huh. They're surprisingly good. Right. They're passive. There's an amplifier back in the machine room. A few years ago, we redid the floors in the living room. And when we did, we had the floors open. We actually put new floors in. Before we closed it all up, we ran some conduits. We ran a couple of conduits for the speaker wires. Ah, nice. I'm sorry, I don't have wires hanging off them. Right, right, take advantage of all that. That's awesome. I love the way you've, you've found ways to work with mm -hmm. the space that you have and the, the situation that you're in here with things like those uh, height speakers and, and the like, multi-channel compressor. I, guess it's, I, I love seeing that because that's the way we all have to do things. Well, that's the thing. You, you, uh, there's a million ways to do it. You know, there really are. I and mean, when, when we first did this, we, I, I bought a very expensive monitor controller and we wired it all with Dante. But it turned out that I didn't need the, monitor, the expensive monitor controller and I didn't need to Dante. I didn't need to wire it all up digitally. I just used the, the Symphony, which my wife pointed out. And then we decided, oh, maybe we could add a few features to this. And so the, the guys over there have been working on this uh, update, which is now available. Right, which gives you the multiple workflows That's and right. the Atmos uh, volume control and all like, those things. Yeah, and, and you'd have a say an Atmos setup, you have a 5.1 setup, you know all kinds of different things. Right, right, very versatile for working with that. So let's play a little uh, game of Ask Bob. All right. So I see some LA3A compressors here, and I know you've got a plug-in version of that as well. That's right. What do you use the LA3As on? Uh, mostly vocals. Uh-huh. You know, um, I, I like the LA3 because it's very transparent. I prefer it, believe it or not, over the LA2. I'm not sure why. It just sounds a little more musical to me. It's, it's a little faster, I think. Uh -huh. I think that sometimes it seems like the LA2 is a little sluggish. I don't know if that's true. It might be just my perception. Right. I don't know. Right. But uh, I've always preferred the LA3. I have 1178s. Right. You know, most people say 1176 is really the, the blackface 1176 is the thing that everybody likes. But I actually like these a little bit better. 
Yeah. And they, they're different. There's something different about them. And when I have to use it at 1176, uh, I'm not quite as happy with it. Right. Not only that, but you get two in the space of one. In the space one. of one, right, right. And so <laughs> what do you stereo. use those on, typically? Uh, snare drum. Okay. Tom-toms. It's great for tom-toms because it's stereo. You can link the, the channels together. Sure. Uh, and sometimes vocals. Okay. Right. You know, and then sometimes, maybe sometimes a guitar. But I really like the distressors. On, on guitars? Is that what you... Guitars and um, acoustic guitars in particular. The, there's not many compressors that, that can deal with acoustic guitar without it sounding like it's fighting. Mm -hmm. Those things, they don't. It just makes it sound more present and louder and it just makes the acoustic guitars cut through the mix right. to me. Dave Durr, who designed those, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant guy. guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you've got four EQP uh, Pultex. Yeah, the 1As. Uh, what do you put those on typically? Well, one of them's on snare drum, which is really the transistor one, which is at the bottom. There's five. There's five, actually. Yeah, yeah that's usually on the snare drum after the the, uh, the which is 1178. Two of the top, which are the reissues, which I love, are very often on piano. I'll, I'll go through the, the SSL compressor quite often. I mean, not always, you know. Depends on the music. Of course. They don't always do the same thing. But quite often, for like a rock piano, the SSL compressor, which is the same as, as the one in the board, and then into the two top um, EQPs. Nice. Which just sounds, I mean, they're just a wonderful thing for a piano. And then the other two, it'll be either guitars or pianos. Right. And then you've got the, uh, the Chandler limiter as well? Um, I use it once in a while. Okay. Not that much. Maybe sometimes for room mics. Uh -huh. It's kind of a cool sound. Coming over here, the, the old Yamaha SPX 990, I thought was an interesting thing because Yamaha made a, uh, something called the SPX 1000. Mm -hmm. And why did they call this the 990? <laughs> it sounds like it's 10 less, but it's way better than, yeah. the, than the 1000. There's this preset called Symphonic that I really like, but there's some other pretty nice reverbs in there. I remember that preset. That's sort of a, not really a chorusing, but it's a stereo widening it's kind of a thing. It's just a wide, stereo widening. It's a beautiful sound, just very subtle. Yeah, yeah, I know. love that same preset. And then the PCM70s, I have two PCM70s, which are the version two software, because it, there's a thing called large hall or something like that, mm -hmm. but it's got this little, once again, chorusing, it's got this little general chorusing on it, and uh, a guitar player years ago on a, with a band that I worked with, a guy named Curtis, he had a piano recorded on his tape, and I pushed this up and I said, wow, that's really nice. Is that like a MIDI with a bunch of synthesizers or something? He goes, oh no, man, that's just the PCM70. I said, what? I said, well, write that down. <laughs> write down the settings for me, okay? And so they're still in here, and I call it the Acid Hall, because oh, the n original name of the band was Acid Test. Ah. And then they had to change it for various reasons to altered state. Acid Hall is what I call it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You've got, uh, between this rack and, and your other rack, you've got three, at least three Eventide processors, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an H3000. I used to use them for harmonizers. I, I use the, actually, I use the harmonizer plugins now, the Eventide pl plugins right. for that instead. Yeah. Because it's a bit more reliable. Right. Than these. Right. <laughs> they get a bit noisy sometimes. I actually wrote a program for, before the DSP 4000 came out, uh -huh. for them for like a type of a tape flanging uh -huh. kind of thing, which works pretty good, but it's it's a whole process to get that to work. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as we mentioned, Clear Mountain's Domain, a lot of your yeah. ambiences and those kind of sounds. Are there other plugins that you particularly rely on? It, in this rack is a thing called the MXR Phaser Flanger Rack, mm -hmm. right? Which I've always loved, and that was always the on the R&B Fender Road sound yep. and from the '70s. It always had the flanger, and so Apogee and I have come up with a um, phaser, what we call Clear Mountain's phases, mm -hmm. which is pretty much a dupe. An emulation of those, but then we took it to the next step, and it's actually got proper zero crossing tape flanging, which is what the what I wrote for Eventide for yeah, their, right. arm, their DSP four thousand. But this this one is a lot easier to use because it's really just a a button because you can have delay compensation in Pro Tools. It's just really easy. It's just a button, and then right. you can do it manually. You can do it. You can sweep it. You can do it stereo, all kinds of different things in there. People should at least try that plugin because uh -huh. it's pretty great. Yeah. I mean, I'm really proud of it. The guys at Apogee really 
went to the next level on that one, I think. So in the analog domain then, signals coming into the console, what are you relying on the console to do for you? Obviously it sounds great, man. This, the the uh, G-series EQ, or it's actually the E-series EQ that I'm using, mm -hmm. is I think it's one of the best equalizers on the planet, you know, besides the Poltex. I mean, it's a whole different type because you can really carve things out out of that thing. Mm -hmm. You can, and it's very specific because it's fully parametric. And I love that. There's dynamics on every channel, which really is helpful. The thing I like the most is the automation, believe it or not. Yeah. It's last uh, software update was 95. Wow. It still runs on floppy disks. Wow. It's ancient, works perfectly. Okay, how many computers do you know from the 80s, <laughs> right. 70s and 80s still works? Right, right. You know, and it, it's just really great automation. And it's funny, I hate to say this, but I use a DAW. I've tried to mix in Pro Tools and Logic, and I feel like I've gone back to the Stone Age <laughs> compared to this. Wow. You know, the things that you can do with this, especially in VCA mode, that you just can't do with more modern systems. I mean, like, you can keep every, every mix. You can, it basically makes a playlist of your mixes. Mm -hmm. So you can edit between mixes and... There's so many things. I mean, don't even get me started. <laughs> you know. Right. And it's a whole whole workflow thing, working yeah. with analog desk and, and uh, kind of performing the mix as you, uh, as you it, do it. It really is. You know, I mean, I can sit here and I don't have to think about anything technical. You know, everything is always doing the same thing. I love getting up and moving around and, you know, I, I, I get moving on this thing. I don't have to think about I don't like thinking too much, right. Right? and this is great because I don't really have to think much. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many routing possibilities on this board that are really easy to do. Right. So with all of the, the, the new Atmos mixes that labels are looking for and, and a lot of the artists are getting albums are coming out that they were working on during the, the pandemic yeah. and things, I assume you're pretty busy down here. Pretty busy. I have been, yeah. I mean, I've mixed in the last year maybe nine or ten app albums in Atmos and stereo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, just just a lot, a lot That's going awesome. on. That's awesome. You know, and some some pretty gr great things, and it's I, I just love it. I still love my Dyn audios, although they're getting you know I'm trying to find drivers for because <laughs> <laughs> you use them a little really, bit. They're really old. <laughs> they're getting old. <laughs> right, the stuff works, and that's what matters. It all it works. Gets, gets the job done. Bob, thanks so much. We really appreciate you uh, you giving us a look inside your your private Clear Mountains domain. Sure. <laughs> Do it quite a race. And uh, but, man, it's just a, a real treat to be here. I know a lot of people have asked, oh, what happened in the NS10s? Yeah. Right? Yep. Okay, well, a little explanation. <laughs> um, I've been using those th for every for years, and a lot of people know. Apogee was thinking about doing a speaker with my name on it. But so Yamaha was interested in, in doing that a few years ago. So they lent me these speakers, which are called the, the MSP7s, I think they're called. Mm -hmm. They sat under my console for about a year. I just didn't, I was so busy that I just never had a chance to. So one day, finally, I put them up and I went, wow, these are really cool. Of course, they stopped making them like in 2010 or something like that. <laughs> this is one of the only pairs that in existence, I think. There's probably a few more pairs somewhere. Right. But So you went from NS10s that are long discontinued and yeah. all that to MSP7s that are long discontinued. and. <laughs> yeah, these are fully powered and biamped and right, right. And they just they're they're like the same size, but they just sound a bit better. They're not as harsh, mm -hmm. and they go the bottom end is a bit, a bit smoother and lower. Right. You know, and so uh, I wish they'd make them again. I yeah. really do. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe they'll see this video and they will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Bob. Always right. a pleasure. Yeah, sure. Great to see you. And thanks for uh, allowing us to come into your, uh, to your studio. It's been a blast. My pleasure. Right. It's always great to see you, Mitch. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you for joining us here. We're at Mix This in Los Angeles with Bob Clearmountain. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.